Ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this UN 75 talk with the UN Kuwait and the Intisar Foundation discussing women, war, mental health, and the quest for peace. I'm humbled and honored to be moderating this distinguished gender balanced panel. Yeah. Oftentimes uh, in this day and age, we still attend conferences and webinars with all male panels, better known as manals. Uh, I'm very happy to see that UN Kuwait and the Intisar Foundation are leading by example on this issue, embracing true UN inclusive values. We have with us today uh, Dr. Tariq Sheikh, representative of the United Nations Secretary General and resident coordinator to the state of Kuwait. Her Highness Sheikha Antisar Subah, founder and president of Antisar Foundation. Mr. Mohammed Nasiri, director of Asia Pacific Regions for UN Women. Dr. Lina Kredi, senior researcher at Antisar Foundation and a political psychologist and Dr. Samar Haddadin, head of UNHCR office to the state of Kuwait. And a very special guest, Mrs. Fatima Khalife, a voice of inspiration and an empowered woman from the Intisar Foundation. A few housekeeping points before we start. Kindly, I ask all participants to mute their microphones, uh, unless of course they have the floor to speak. For Arabic translation, for all our participants, uh, you can go to the chat box and there's a YouTube link there from UN Kuwait where the whole session will be translated in, into Arabic. And I would like us all to have a still moment because I was asked that a picture will be taken, a family photo of the panel. So as best as a, to, our, to the best of our abilities, let's try to do this online. And uh, please let me know when uh, we can move on. All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Global Peace Index of 2019, the MENA region is the least peaceful region in the world. Plagued by wars and armed conflict, many Arab countries continue to struggle in their quest for peace. Extensive literature over the years has shown that women are the most impacted from conflict and wars. Furthermore, women are especially more vulnerable to the psychological impact of such events. A lasting negative impact is inevitable on the mental health and emotional well being of survivors, many of whom become internally displaced persons or are refugees. As 2020 marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325, the first of 10 resolutions focusing on women, peace and security, and the five-year milestone of the SDGs, it is very timely that UN Kuwait and the Intisar Foundation have chosen to discuss this topic today. After all, Peace in our society relies greatly on the mental health of half of the population of that society. The Intisar Foundation and the United Nations were both founded after wars and are both on a mission to instill peace and to prevent more conflict. And they are also both guided by the principle that women can be peacemakers. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Tariq Sheikh, the representative of the UN Secretary General and UN Residence Coordinator to the State of Kuwait. Dr. Sheikh, thank you for being with us today. I don't think I can do justice to your bio in 30 seconds, so forgive me if I miss anything. You have worked around two decades in various UN agencies and UN country teams, you are an expert in policies and strategies of urban development formulation. You are the author of numerous publications and articles in international journals on planning, community, and urban sustainability. Dr. Desheikh, please tell us more about the work and the role of the UN in the state of Kuwait. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karma, for this uh, very interesting introduction. And uh, I would like also uh, to extend my uh, thanks and deep appreciation to Sheikh Antasar al-Sabah and Antasar Foundation for the innovative ideas they always bring to uh, the, the, the sustainable development community in Kuwait and uh, beyond Kuwait. Uh, and I would like to start by welcoming all ladies and gentlemen present with us today and particularly also our distinguished ambassadors uh, in the diplomatic community uh, in Kuwait and members of the diplomatic corps and all uh, members of the uh, state of Kuwait. I also would like to uh, welcome and appreciate the presence of uh, my dear colleagues, uh, Mohammed al Nasseri uh, from UN Women, Regional Director for Asia Pacific, and also my dear colleague, Samir Haddadin, the representative of the uh, UNHCR in the state of Kuwait and all distinguished speakers uh, who are going to be uh, presenting to us different interesting parts of uh, women, war, mental health and the quest for peace. Uh, let me start uh, my words by recalling the Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres' call for the war to stop war, armed conflict and ceasefire and unify to fight the COVID pandemic. War is not only destroying economies, infrastructure, cities. It is tearing people and families apart, destroying physical and mental health, but also breaking children and young women psychologically, and also leaving people in grief, sorrow, and no hope for the future. It does not only displace people and families, but also displaces hearts and minds. Violence against women during conflict has reached epidemic, epidemic proportions. Civilians have become, become the primary targets of groups who use terror as a tactic of war. Uh, in all religions, people were instructed to respect, cherish, and appreciate women. They are the reason for our existence, the backbones of families, supporting, working, and nurturing communities to grow. In war, the United Nations, and as Karma has mentioned, have always fought for the protection of women and children against violence and impact of war. With the pandemic as an additional burden on women in conflict areas, no, no, not only health, but mental health become crucial to continue surviving and supporting families and communities and young children, and continuing working hand in hand with their partners of development for aspiring peace and stability. In this path, mental health through innovative approaches and means gains great importance and particularly during this pandemic. With the limitation of mental health services to women in conflict areas, various alternative approaches for psychological healing are needed. The innovation of Intisar Foundation to use drama for psychological therapy and mental well-being of women in conflict areas and refugees is another innovation added to the type of work in the SAR Foundation adopt in ensuring behavioral change and reversing impact of war on women and families, and also the wider community in conflict. It is our aim to realize peace, safety, and well-being, and this would not happen materialized without such kind of innovation and innovative ideas and bringing this to practice. We have today our distinguished discussants who are going to present to us different views and approaches to the role of women in research, in practice, to ensure that women has an active and will continue having an active role in peace, safety, and securities for our families and, and communities to aspiring for peace. I wish to thank you all again and thank you, Sheikh Antasar, for this opportunity and for this innovative idea. And I look forward with eagerness to listen to uh, my fellow uh, participants and my fellow colleagues who are going to discuss uh, the topic. Thank you so much. And over to you, Karma. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheikh, for your uh, opening remarks. Uh, the impact has been definitely further exacerbated by COVID-19, which added a whole new layer of complexity and challenge for women and mental health, uh, our mental health, all of us included. Um, I will now move to our next panelist. Our next panelist is the ultimate champion of making our Arab society better and more peaceful. 
Her Highness Sheikha Antisara Subah is the founder and president at the Intisar Foundation. She is on a mission to bring peace. She is a firm believer of how positive psychological intervention can be transformational and has launched the One Million Arab Women Initiative that aims to heal and empower one million Arab women through the use of drama therapy. Sheikha Antisar, today we are discussing women war and mental health. You are someone who has experienced this firsthand during uh, the Kuwait invasion. Please tell us more about how your war experience has led you to start the Intisar Foundation and how you believe your drama therapy program is bringing about sustainable change for women's mental health across the Arab world. Uh, uh, thank you, ev each and everyone, starting with Dr. Tariq, Mr. Mohammed, Dr. Samir, uh, Karma, Dr. Lina, and the Fatma, ala tawajidkum. Thank you for the, the enthusiasm for a different kind of peace process in the Arab world, a creative uh, process, um, an even innovative process, but also uh, evidence-based as we will share with you later on. So I would like to start with your permission to uh, give you a brief of how we started the foundation and what brought around um, the, the vision of women being peace agents in the Arab world. It started, as uh, many of you know, when I was approached by the International Committee for the Red Cross to do a roundtable in Kuwait advocating, advocating and raising awareness of the plight of Arab women in war. And during uh, the discussions, one of the recommendations was to have more physical um, and mental health for women. And uh, when uh, I discussed with the international the ICRC what was being uh, given to women affected by war, especially as you said, Karma, they are the biggest victims of war. Zero focus on the psychological support of women. That shocked me. I didn't think that we, and I'll say we because we are all responsible for supporting other people. And I was shocked that there was no focus whatsoever on the psychological support of women, even though they were the most affected. And um, with the support of the UN, again, thank you, Dr. Tariq, and uh, the UNHCR, uh, I started with, uh, so I, the thought was, how, how about we start something supporting women uh, affected by war psychologically. So we uh, started uh, mapping what was being done. So uh, we went to Lebanon and Jordan to see what was being done psychologically for women and why it wasn't bigger. And basically what we realized was um, there was no focus because of the stigma of uh, her stigma, the woman's stigma, of her family's, uh, you know, shame of her seeking um, a therapist, of her, the woman not wanting to be in a room by herself with a therapist. Most scared women don't be, want to be in a closed room. And the last one was she didn't want to relive her pain. And so we had to find an alternative way and not, nothing, nothing is better than the arts. And so we looked at the arts and we realized drama therapy through trial and error, the drama therapy was the best way to go. And I will later on explain to you our latest discovery of why drama therapy is the best way to go. And this, this is our latest discovery and it's beautiful. And I will share with you because I know you'll all love why. So um, one of the things I would like to thank the UN for also is the UN started after the Second World War and the objective was to stop wars from happening in the future. And this webinar 
is a beautiful collaboration between two entities, one huge and one fledgling and just starting, about how to stop future wars by moderating, by allowing people to express themselves, by allowing um, peace within the countries and so within the region. So I, I just thought it's very interesting that it's the 75th year for the UN and we're having this amazing webinar together. So thank you again, Dr. Tarek. So what is it about drama therapy that makes it desirable for the, uh, the participants? Number one, it's creative. So people like, uh, let's say, working with their creativity, it uh, our beneficiaries um, tell their families that they are going to a cultural activity, not a therapy. So sometimes they say it's a therapy and if they're there's an aversion to therapy, they can say, we're going to a cultural activity. So that works very well. It works on the mind and the body and the emotions. And it's a community approach. So it's the women getting together, talking about their problems, reenacting their um, experiences, uh, role playing, uh, venting, but also moving and there's, I mean, drama therapy encompasses a lot of things under the umbrella of drama therapy. And the great thing about it, it is taught in many universities. So there is evidence on the um, effect of drama therapy, which is not the same in other smaller therapies. And that's one of the reasons we thought we chose it. One of the reasons for our success is that we worked very smartly. So what we did with the help of the UNHCR, we went to see uh, what was being done and then worked with local NGOs to find the easiest, the simplest, and the cheapest way to start. And so what we do is we collaborate with local NGOs who have the network, they have the know-how, they have the space, and they have the trust of the community. And so we work with local NGOs to bring that uh, amazing group of women who we work with and we work between 12 to 16 sessions depending on the severity of the group and uh, and the sessions are three hours every week and after that it's we do a whole year of follow-up which is once a month so we we basically thank god found the perfect formula that works with the women um, we have research uh, on the evidence of what we do, and we are uh, making more research, as Dr. Lina will point out later on. Um, and because our whole logistics is local, there is a trust in what we do. And this trust allows the women to feel more, talk more, engage more, and therefore release more. So that is one thing we're very grateful for. Um, and if I may just share with you um, a little something about what our latest discovery about drama therapy is. So what we realized, and this we've, we've just realized in the past um, couple of months, is um, can we go to the next page? What drama therapy? Difference between drama therapy and other uh, therapies simply is when the body is the first impacted by a trauma, be it war or any shock. The first thing it goes to is the body. So the body is firstly impacted, and then after that it gets to our emotions, and then it gets to our mind. So. First the body, so we stop breathing, we freeze, whatever it is. The first impact of trauma is always on the body. And then we start having the emotions of fear, of anxiety, whatever it is. And then it starts being rational, rationalized in our minds. And this triangle is exactly what drama therapy releases. It releases the trauma from the body, from the emotions, 
and from the cognitive and the narrative. So we do body movements, we allow the women to speak about their emotions, to engage with their emotions, to stop the numbness that usually women or people get when they're traumatized. And then it starts rationalizing in their mind and they're able to, using their mind at the end, release the memories that are holding that uh, emotion. And this, is in drama therapy. I'm not sure 100% yet if it's in any other therapy, but so far what we're finding is it only exists in drama therapy, all three modalities of releasing the emotions or releasing the trauma on a human being. Um, so that is something I thought was very interesting I wanted to share. And so if you can put all of it, so here it is. So usually cog people use cognitive approaches, but that you're tackling the mind, but you're not tackling the emotions or the body. And this triangle is why we are able within a very short time to have so much success, so much changes within the women that Dr. Lina uh, has found it so easy to do all the research and prove that drama therapy works with women to release their trauma and to bring on uh, peace. Some of the sy symptoms of, that get in the way of peace are, and these are all trauma related, anger, aggressive behavior, anxiety, and, a, and an inability to express oneself. And again, all of these are tackled with drama therapy. That is why also our women find peace so much easier. Our women have done lots of uh, therapies and lots of uh, lectures, all of that with drama therapy because it hits all three. They're finding it much easier to be in that very peaceful uh, state and also to be able to bring that peace to their families, to stop the aggression, to stop the violence within themselves, within their families, within their community, and inshallah, inshallah, within the region. So I just wanted to share that because I thought that was uh, very interesting. And uh, the last thing is one of the things which found out also, which is beautiful, and we have lots of uh, testimonials from the women, is they became more communicative with their emotions with themselves and with their families. So one of the beautiful thing is the women are allowing their families to be expressive. And all research has proved that expressive people are less violent. So this is an amazing thing. Um, I have um, a testimonial from one of our beneficiaries and I think that encompasses everything I've just said. She says, as long as I am in peace, my children are at peace. As long as my children are at peace, the country is at peace. Indeed, that's uh, so I, that encompasses everything. I mean, I could go on forever and talk about everything we do. We do, we do very, very focused work on how to release trauma in these women, to be able to release it in their families, in their communities, especially that they're women getting together in the same area and we stay within the same area to create that um, umbrella of peace within that uh, community. Because if we just empower uh, five or 10 women and we leave the community, we've done nothing. So one of our biggest tactics is to stay within the community until we get the tipping point which is a minimum of 12.5% of the population. With that tipping point, the women will be able to support each other to grow the peace process within themselves, within their families, and within the region they're in. And inshallah, that's a ripple effect that goes um, to many other communities and ultimately in the Arab world. Uh, one of our, um, so one of our goals is um, to have 600 drama therapists and um, um, facilitators. Sheikha Antisar, if I may, because 
This is exactly one of the questions that. Okay, one fantastic. Then you can ask me questions, and I'll stop now. I no, think no, enough. No, there is a question that we have received from one of our participants saying, "You have this ambitious goal of reaching out to one yeah. million Arab women, but we know that there is a shortage in drama therapists in the Arab world. So, how are you planning to overcome this shortage to move forward with your goal?" Okay, so I'm going to be jumping between what I'm supposed to start with and what I'm, I'm supposed to end with, but I will answer that question. So uh, we, we have already signed uh, an agreement with Uzek University in Lebanon to train this year 15 drama therapists. Wow. And we were, we're also negotiating with other top universities in around the world to also have drama therapists. And this is how we're going to tackle it. But at the end, I'll also tell you how the COVID has allowed us to even grow our ambition and simplify it because we are going online. So uh, basically, uh, by having more drama therapists and facilitators, we can reach a bigger pool of women. By reaching a bigger pool of women in different countries, we're able to grow the ripple effect in their communities and in the region. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tara, we also have a question for you from one of the participants asking, what is the UN mandate for mental health and especially mental health for women? Uh, first of all, the, the Secretary General recently has recognized that mental health is one of the key areas that we should be uh, focusing on. And this was well before uh, the pandemic and uh, last September, uh, the Secretary General has initiated the mental health strategy of the United Nations, uh, by which we look into internally and also externally how we engage into uh, different forms of uh, managing the stress uh, managing workload, managing conflict, managing issues that impact the stress and well-being of population. And uh, also this was so important during the pandemic to look at how we can uh, structure that. And it is one of the core pillars of the, uh, the United Nations uh, response plan uh, in this uh, pandemic. Uh, and the socio-economic plan of the United framework of the United Nations as health and well-being as one of the strategies by which the United Nations is focusing on, on this particular issue. It's through developing different projects and programs within the different countries. Uh, public health and, psychologi and psychological health and different forms of innovation are what we aim for and what we aspire for. And that's why we are also uh, uh, joining forces with you here to look into different alternative approaches for uh, mental therapy. And uh, in many countries of the world, one of the, one of the first uh, events that we started here in our United Nations, Kuwait, was about uh, mental health and well-being. And uh, it was open for internally and for externally to the United Nations to look in, into that. We have different stress counselors in different forms and in different duty stations who are working and supporting. But because of the, uh, the, uh, the situation is huge uh, and the, the need is high, it is very important that we expand that. Uh, within the limitation of resources, we will try as much as possible to integrate and to partner with institutions to complement capacities. And this is what we aspire for from also uh, this engagement today. And also my colleagues will be adding more to what I have said. Well, what better way to increase your capacity than to have more political psychologists? And here we have our next panelist, uh, Dr. Lina Credie, consultant and senior researcher at the Intisar Foundation. Dr. Kredia, you are a political psychologist and a lecturer at the Lebanese American University. As a Fulbright scholar in Jordan, you study the impact of trauma and resilience on Syrian refugees. Um, your current, oh, did we lose? Are you still with us? I don't see you anymore. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right. So uh, Dr. Kredia's current focus, research focus, is on the power of theater expression and communication as a psychological therapeutical intervention in refugee camps. 
Dr. Kredi, impact of wars on the mental health of women is an under-researched topic, relatively silenced topic. Um, therefore, the work you are doing is very uh, avant-gardiste, especially in our region. Please uh, tell us more about the research you have conducted with the Intisar Foundation, your findings, the challenges you're facing, and why you think there is an absolute need for this kind of research and, and the role of this research to advocate for policy change. Dr. Lina? Okay, I'm so sorry, guys. It was uh, the quick, uh, usual introduction to say hello, everyone. Salam alaikum. And uh, thank you for. Um, for the United Nations uh, Kuwait office to uh, to have us all um, be part of uh, promoting and fostering peace in the region as an NGO and as individuals and as researchers and participants and practitioners. All of us, we really would like to be part of the peacemaking. And uh, in this our foundation, uh, something I've you know, I'm so passionate to work for and be part of the research because it answers many of the questions I had doing my research for the last four, six years on refugees and on suffering, specifically psychological suffering, mental health. And uh, we will be adding also, it's not only mental, this is another uh, caveat. Mental is also physiological. It's highly connected. Neuroscience research is now expanding to look at the mental health um, uh, relationship to conflicts and to lack of peace um, uh, for people who are impacted by trauma to include, of course, war. Um, so the work um, we have been doing with Intisar Foundation is focused on civilians. You know, you mentioned Karma. There is a lot of research uh, all over the world on trauma, on war, and most of the trauma impacted is on combatants, on veterans. Very little is done on civilians. And when we come to our region, maybe there is some work done on Palestinian children but not much on refugees in other parts of the region. And, um, and when we discuss refugees, we're talking about vulnerable people and who are actually fleeing their countries to another vulnerable uh, country, whether it's Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. And you know, this is why our focus has been on two countries that are also as host countries have been impacted and the trauma the host countries have is impacting also the, uh, I'm trying to move my slide, um, to uh, have been impacting the Syrian refugees and Palestinian refugees, move, changing them from just victims of war to also a burden and becoming perpetrators. And this adds to the trauma on the refugees instead of feeling that they are hosted um, with comfort, but they have to also suffer from this trauma. So when we, when we discuss um, that the suffering, as uh, Sheikh Antisar mentioned, there is, you know, as refugees, they are suffering, but we have pre-migration. Uh, they could be suffering from all the lists that you see on my slides here, from witnessing, actually with witnessing violent events to destruction of their property, loss of uh, their role, um, death of a family member, and of course, forced displacement, internal and external. But this, the, the, the issue does not stop there. It could be the road to migration. And as we all know, the Syrian refugees and before the Palestinian refugees have suffered from. And then the post-migration, you know, where they are ho being hosted. I know in Jordan, they are more like structured. Uh, I've worked with in camps and off camps. And, you know, their situation could be a little better than the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, but there are common sufferings for both in both countries. 
uh, from insecure living situation, uncertainty of where are we going and the issue of repatriation and uh, the political issues and the instabilities. As I mentioned, they became no longer just victims, but also perpetrators and they are suffering from racism and xenophobia and lack of opportunities. Yes, they take jobs and this is how they are accused of, but also they don't have enough jobs for everyone. Identity confusion, you know, when you're talking about refugees coming to Lebanon or Syria, they're coming to an Arab country. And, but then they are no longer part of this, but they become with a refugee status that adds to their uh, identity confusion. So there are a lot of um, trauma that is impacting and it's ongoing. It's not like it happened once and that's it. So we are dealing with civilians with ongoing trauma. There's a study done on you know, mental health as uh, uh, the, the main topic of uh, our uh, forum today. Uh, there's a lot of need for mental health uh, counseling, healing, treatment, uh, because of the big numbers that we see in, from different studies, like this uh, Dutch uh, NGO did work in Lebanon. And they found that, you know, depression is, you know, 43%, you know, half the population are depressed. Are we all going to take medication? Are there enough counseling services? And uh, anxiety disorders, which is also, although it shows it's 26.6%, uh, you know, 30% of the population, imagine, you know, it's a lot of people, you know, it, it, you know, and it's not even when, when even when we discuss post-traumatic stress disorder, which is more physiological ad, in addition to mental, uh, we we see that if when when we when I did the study in Lebanon in camps, of course Lebanese off camps, uh, I found really high um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, which also I found that it is highly related to violence and to aggression because they have low impulse control, they're angry, they're unforgiving giving, uh, they, they have a lot of psychological issues. You know, I can discuss this uh, at a further uh, study, but it, it is really high. And the problem at that time, which I found the solution with uh, Intisar Foundation is, I found very little clinics, counseling services that deal with such issues. You know, the UN does have offices, but there is more needed to, uh, to um, actually help those uh, impacted. Uh, so definitely mental health and psychosocial services for refugees are very important. And this is where we need to look at, you know, their hopelessness, their psychomatic pain, you know, the physiological and the mental and the psychological symptoms they suffer from. You know, the aggressive behavior, the anger, domestic violence. It's not only men hitting women, but women hitting their children or becoming violent. So this gendered also behavior that we need to look at. Uh, lack of productivity. It's not enough to give them microfinancing and give them money and to be productive, but they need to be mentally and psychologically able to produce and uh, do better. Maladaptive behavior is another aspect which also adds to um, the need for uh, mental health and psychosocial uh, services. Um, as uh, Sheikh Antisar mentioned, and uh, most of you are well aware, there's not enough uh, services. It's scarce, it's underfunded. Uh, Lebanon and Jordan have the highest refugee population. And we're talking about the population of the Lebanese who need uh, also services who are lacking. So now we're adding refugees that need also services. Um, so in Jordan, there are only two mental health professionals per 100,000 residents of the country. In Lebanon, there are 1.5 mental health professionals per 100,000 residents uh, of the country. So there are situational issues, and you know we call them like external factors, but also dispositional factors. External factors, it's expensive, not enough. Um, too far from where they live, they have to commute, and it's not easy to commute to most of them. Lack of outreach. Uh, as also Sheikha mentioned, stigmatization, lack of awareness, cultural barriers, it's a taboo, you know, I'm not crazy to go to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, 
mistrust in what is around and what is available in around them. Um, you know, linking this to peace is very important because we have to look at the foundation of our communities. We always blame politics and politicians and global and regional and local, but we have to look at the people because wars destroy not only buildings, but also human beings. So if those human beings are destroyed, then we cannot build peace. And when we discuss peace from the bottom up, only men and women to be, uh, you know, able to, uh, to produce and to be effective and to be, you know, then uh, where we look at their human security in, an, in a way where they can actually be part of uh, having an effective uh, security and peaceful uh, community. For sustainable peace, hence the voices of women, but strong women, should be uh, included in, in projects that have an ending war and suffering in conflict zone areas. It, I'm not talking about being, you know, moderators or mediators, you know, definitely they have to be, but also as in their communities. Um, so in, uh, at Antistar Foundation, our aim is to empower uh, women, trauma-impacted women, socioeconomically disadvantaged refugees and others to express their voices, their wants and needs. Usually they, they tend to be less uh, uh, vocal. And all of this help us form a strong foundation for bottom-up peace building. Uh, why drama therapy? I'm not going to go much into this, but uh, definitely Sheikh Antisar gave an excellent idea that it is not stigmatizing. You're on a theater, you're talking about your story. It's like moving from reality to kind of fiction, but it's a story, your story. You're expressing yourself, you're getting your anger out. You're dealing with other people. You're no longer in your own bubble, but you're out there. Um, you know, our programs, we have been really connecting well with local and trusted NGOs within camps. Um, drama therapy uses body, voice, and mind. So it is individual and collective uh, ability. It promotes catharsis, meaning express yourself, say what makes you angry. But over time, with all the sessions we do, we noticed that this became better and will explain this even better. It improves resilience, not only becoming numb to what's happening around us, but being to stand up and be uh, productive. So in, in terms of drama therapy, it covers, and also Sheikha mentioned this, the situational factors, the dispositional factors, and the social and family support. We're taking them from their home, from whatever, adds to their trauma to a safer place, could it be the theater? Or as we are now expanding into a virtual platform. Uh, in terms of lack of trust, we're building bridges of communication by strengthening women's ability to express themselves. It's a social and family support, you know, more social openness, more collective work. Uh, so our findings uh, from the research we've done, most of it, uh, the one that already published is qualitative work because we believe that the narrative of those women is very important. It doesn't mean that we didn't do quantitative, we did, but the, the qualitative was the main focus in the research already published. We have other research in process that has been submitted and uh, plans for future uh, in 21, 22 uh, to be done also. So from our findings, 78% of our participants experienced increased self-esteem, very important. Reduction in PTSD. PTSD was, if I may say this in Arabic, it used to say, you know, there's no treatment for PTSD. No, there has been a reduction in post-traumatic stress disorder because people were able to reduce their, you know, when we discuss the neuroscience aspect of it, we'll see how some parts of the brain take over if you train the other part that was impacted by PTSD and improve uh, cognitive uh, and emotional and memory behavior. 93.75% of our participants experienced reduction in depression. 75% experienced reduction in anxiety, 43% plus uh, of our participants experienced improvement in satisfaction uh, in the situation of their life. So, um, and positive emotions, positive experiences, they started to be more positive and uh, less 
uh, expressing their negative emotions. So this is the topic, the research, if you're interested to look at the power of theater expression and communication. This is the published uh, article that we, th we actually would want it to title and uh, it is titled as Psychological Therapeutical Intervention. So it's an intervention in the emotions and the physiological and the communication abilities of people. It's an experience. Dr. So, uh, yes. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's yes. just because uh, we are a little bit pressed on time. And okay. uh, I wanted to just say that your numbers are extremely heartwarming. Uh, thank you for sharing those because we had uh, many questions asking about the percentages. Yes. I'm very happy that you replied. I just want to give you one question from the participants and then give oh. you another three minutes to continue. Maybe you can also answer the question that has been shared with us. Uh, are there research, is there research being done in the Arab world about other creative therapies? And if not, why, why not Intisar Foundation to pioneer uh, this, uh, these, uh, these researches? So that's uh, one question I leave with you and I'm sorry to have interrupted, but just needed no to ring the alarm bell. <laughs> yes, no problem. Actually, so the question is about, is there in the Arab world other NGOs or other institutions? Creative therapies, research on creative therapies. Uh, I'm not aware of any other research on uh, creative uh, therapy. There could be, but we have been doing research and uh, actually <clears throat> we have an excellent team, which I also I would like to uh, discuss saying that they have been doing great work like Sarah Saki and others uh, and the drama therapists who have been researching. We found there is, we didn't find any research related to drama therapy or creative therapy. So we are uh, pioneers in this. If there is any, I would like, you know, to also find that, but up till now, I didn't really find any uh, creative therapy research. No. So I don't know if I answered the question here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so shall I continue? Uh, if we can uh, wrap up in the next minute and a half okay. so that I can give the floor okay. to our special guest to speak from her experience with this uh, program. Okay. okay, I'm sorry. Uh, no. so, okay, uh, so we noticed, as I mentioned, re uh, reduction of negative effects, improvement of positive effects, and more community work. Um, also, I uh, would like to mention something about um, our uh, future projects. Uh, because you know drama therapy adds something uh, about empathy role playing so empathy is very important in peacemaking uh, which uh, it's about the ability to communicate effectively it's about standing up not standing by uncovering what's below the surface so it is very important in peace building we are going to uh, to work more on this in our post uh, and in our questionnaires um, we are going to also uh, do neuroscience and drama therapy because wow. it impacts the brain and the, specifically the prefrontal cortex, which is the decision-making process, is highly impacted by uh, trauma. So uh, we would like to study and see how drama therapy moves, you know, the, uh, the emotional and the memory uh, affected area to other areas where we can be more positive and less negative. We're not talking about complete healing, but at least, you know, people becoming more productive and able to think better and be uh, more productive. Definitely, there is a lot of need for more research and we are on the right track. We are going to do more and more. We will reach one million uh, Arab women, hopefully more, by doing the drama therapy, by advocating other NGOs to join us and to do more work and doing it online. Because, you know, this uh, COVID-19 has put limitations on actual field work, but we are doing a lot of online sessions and those online sessions are doing really well and uh, it opens to the whole world. So uh, Arab women everywhere, not only in the Arab region, because there are refugees, you know, and migrants who also have traumas and need to be um, also helped. So our uh, goal is... Um, uh, you know, to make this new creative uh, approach to helping uh, women become more, um, you know, used, 
you know, for us, we're going to definitely do more, but by other NGOs and to get the support, more support from the United Nations and to have a voice uh, to reduce war and to resolve conflicts, not to manage them, to resolve them and to attain peace. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lina. That was uh, truly inspiring, uh, the work that you are doing. And uh, I really hope that this work continues and it has more outreach uh, for you to reach this amazing target of one million women. Oh, thank uh, you. The Intisar Foundation's community-based drama therapy program has proven to be transformational. The program has empowered women to become agents of peace through embracing their own difficult experiences. Our special guest today is Mrs. Fatima Khalife, a courageous woman to say the least. Fatima is a Syrian woman who has suffered a great deal from the war in her country. She is one of the one million Arab women the Intisar Foundation is working with to transform into agents of peace. A Syrian refugee in Lebanon, Fatima is the voice of inspiration in empowering women and her testimony today is a tribute to all refugees in the Arab world. Fatima, ahla wa sahla fiki. 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 من سوريا عمري 43 سنة أنا قصة نجاح بعد تعرفي على مؤسسة انتصار والشيخة انتصار ب... طلعت من سوريا بال2013 وصلت على لبنان My name is Fatima Khalifa. I am 43 years old. I believe that I am a success story after I have had the chance to work with Intisar Foundation and uh, the efforts of Her Highness Sheikha and Sara Sabah. I left Syria in 2013. Uh, I am now the director of a small business in Burj Al Barajni camp where I help other refugee women work on traditional Palestinian embroidery. This success story would not have been possible if it wasn't for my two year long journey with Intisar Foundation. Uh, فكانت هي فسحة للرياحة عن العمل وتضيع وقت. At first, my experience with Intisar Foundation was through the drama therapy program they held inside Shatila camp. At the beginning, for me, it was an experience uh, to to let go of the stress of work and have a little bit of fun. بعد ثلاث جلسات من المتابعة اكتشفت إنه لا هي في شيء أكبر من هيك أكبر من التسلية وأكبر من إنه مجرد مسرح وعم ضيع وقت ونفس فيه بالضحك واللعب. After about three sessions, I discovered that the program was not just about having fun or using theater. I discovered that there was something so much deeper to it. كانت الفرصة إنه أتعرف على التنفس اللي عندي كيف طبيعة تنفسي كنت نسيانة طبيعة التنفس من بداية الحرب من 2011. For example, I had difficulties breathing ever since the war in 2011, and during the sessions, I was able to regain my breath. For example, there was also my body movement, which had become extremely restricted since the civil war. I realized that my body was not helping me express myself. In fact, I was only using my voice to scream during anger. تقريباً بعد خامس جلسة أو سادس جلسة يمكن بالضبط كان عندي الشعور التام بالأمان بهاي الجلسات. 
لدرجة أني تحدثت بأشياء أنا ما كنت أقدر أتحدث فيها حتى بالعيادات النفسية اللي كنت أنا أراجعها After about five or six sessions, I felt safe enough to be able to speak about things that I had not previously disclosed to anyone, including my psychologist, who I had been seeing on a regular basis. إنه أنا أعبر بكل صراحة بكل مصداقية عن أشياء خفية من من سنين أو تسع سنين. Throughout the program, the fact that I was working with a group of women that was around 21 other women besides me. I'm sorry, 20 women besides me. I felt safe and secure enough to be able to talk about things that I had been holding inside me for the last eight years. هون بلش البحث عن فاطمة القديمة طبعاً. فاطمة ما قبل اللجوء، فاطمة ما قبل الدخول إلى المخيم، فاطمة ما قبل الفقدان لعدد كبير من عائلتي وأهلي، من هون بلشت نقطة الصفر عند فاطمة خليفة. And here I've started my journey to find my old self. فاطمة pre-migration, فاطمة pre-war, and فاطمة pre-losing her family members. This was my start point to become a new person. لأنه أنا كنت بسوريا شخصية عامة وشخصية لي قيمتي بالمجتمع وعندي مردود مالي وسيدة مستقلة ماديا الحرب واللجوء خلاني سيدة عفوا أو لاجئة اللجوء خلاني لاجئة بمخيمات اللجوء فاقدة لهويتي الشخصية لا أشعر بالأمان مطلقا غير متحكمة بتصرفاتي شديدة الغضب والعنف على أولادي When I was in Syria I had a certain level of social status. I was a financially independent businesswoman. But when the war happened, I was transformed only to a refugee. And then living in the camps has turned me into a person that is completely different. I became extremely depressed. I became very aggressive towards my children. And I started to suffer with the overcrowding and difficult living conditions inside the camp. ووقف أكثر وفكر أكثر ويصير عندي تواصل أمرا أول شيء مع أولادي ثاني شيء بمحيط عملي ثالث شيء بمحيط المجتمع اللي أنا فيه. I started to breathe more, I started to think more, and I started to become more aware of my feelings and my communication with myself and my children and within my professional life changed and became so much better. من هون بلشت رجع رحلة نجاحي بعتبرها رحلة نجاح بفتخر فيها بعد سقوط تسع سنين أو تسع سنين تقريبا مع أولادي مع الحرية المالية اللي أنا وصلت لها اليوم مع كل الناس اللي رجعت شفتهم وتعرفت عليهم بعد هاي الفترة كيف صار التواصل أنا واستقبالي للشخص الآخر كيف صرت أشعر بالسلام إذا لما أتواصل مع الأشخاص الآخرين كيف أقدر أوصل صوتي بطريقة مسموعة وواضحة كيف أقدر أوصل مطالبي بطريقة شفافة وواضحة ومجدية بنتيجة جيدة جدا. And after almost nine years of nine years of suffering, I realized that I can use the calmness in my voice and the peace within to communicate better with people within my professional and personal life and be able to reach the goals that I want to reach. And I believe that this was some of the steps that helped me get on my journey towards personal and professional success. كانت أول خطوة إلي بالنجاح هي إنه أنا أعمل مشروع صغير بزنس بقلب مخيم برج البراجنا. اليوم عم يشتغل معي 15 سيدة من اللاجئات السوريات والفلسطينيات وحتى بعض اللبنانيات. One of the first steps towards my transition to becoming a more successful person was being able to start my own business, which is a cooperative business that actually helps other refugee women within the camp, around 15 of them. مجلس بأي مناسبة بأي لقاء حتى عمل وهدفي اليوم إنه مؤسسة انتصار 
تكون عم بتساعدني اساعد الستات اللي انا عم بشتغل معاهم هون اليوم ليوصلوا للحاله اللي انا وصلت لها. And as a part of my appreciation for Ansar Foundation and Her Highness Sheikha Ansar Salah, I am here today to thank them and to also say that I would very much like for the foundation to be able to reach the group of women that I am currently working with to empower them as I have been empowered. بالمخيمات ولا اكثر عدد اكبر من الستات يعني مش بس عند انا ما حابه يوقف التعاون بيني وبين مؤسسه انتصار بس عند حدود ال 15 سيد الموجودين معي اليوم لانه حتى انا هدفي يكون عندي اكثر سيدات مستفيدات ماديا. For me this is the start of a chain of success not just for myself or for the 15 women whom I work with but for all the women that I can possibly reach through my business and through my knowledge of Intisar Foundation. لكن هدفي يكون تعاون اكبر بقلب مبدئيا بقلب المخيم اللي انا موجوده فيه واملي انه يكون اوسع بكل المخيمات اللي موجوده او بكل مطارح اللجوء اللي موجوده في لبنان. And my hope is for Intisar Foundation to be able to implement its programs not only where in the camp where I live and work but rather in all the camps in Lebanon and where there are refugees in Lebanon. بتشكر الكل بتش... آه كثير مبسوطه انا على هالفرصه اللي اتاحت لي اشوفكم كلياتكم بتشكرك كثير شيخه انت صار وعن جد انا ممنونه وبتمنى انه اكون عم بوصل الرساله بشكلها الصح بطريقتها الصح اتمنى انه اكون صح شكرا كثير للجميع استاذه فاطمه يعني الهمتينا بصراحتك وبشجاعتك شكرا انك موجوده معنا اليوم شكرا على انك قدرت تحكينا عن تجربتك في سؤال من الـ من البارتيسيبنتس اللي معنا رح اقوله بالانجليزي يمكن المترجمه عندك فيها ترجم لك how did drama therapy shape your life but what was the most memorable experience you had during the sessions with the Intisar foundation أكثر شغلة إنه فضت السواد اللي جوات قلبي يعني أنا ما كنت أستقبل قبل الجلسات بالدراما ما كنت أستقبل أي شيء من برا من الخارج لأنه أصلا عندي جوا حاجز وعندي جوا وجع لما فرغت هذا الوجع وهذا الحاجز الداخلي صار استقبالي للأشياء اللي من برا أنطف صارت تفوت صارت تلاقي مكان يعني صرت إذا أسمع نصيحة أعرف إذا هاي النصيحة مفيدة أو لا هذا الطريق صح أو لا؟ أما قبل الجلسات أنا كل اللي كان عندي هو عدائية ونرجسية. Before the sessions, uh, I was extremely resistant and I was not accepting of what others would tell me. After we started the sessions, I realized that I became more open, I had less aggression, and I had a better belief of what people were willing to tell me. وغيرت الجلسات كمان أهم نقطة بحياتي اللي هي أولادي. أنا هم المكسب الوحيد اللي اليوم كسبته من بعد الحرب بسوريا أه عم حاول اليوم أبني علاقة كتير جديدة بيني وبين أطفالي عفوا هم مش أطفال عندي طفلة صغيرة هم صاروا كبار للأسف راح من عمري كتير راحت هاي الفترة ما كنت أشوف كيف عم يكبر أولادي قدامي اليوم عم حاول أشوف كيف فيني أعود هاي الفترة اللي راحت وكيف فيني أجنب طفلتي الصغيرة كل المآس اللي مروا فيها أولاد الثلاثة الكبار يعني كيف فينا اليوم أكون أم كتير منيحة مع بنتي بطريقة كتير سلسة كتير بسلام كتير بدون عدوانية Another area that I benefited from in the sessions was with my children. Unfortunately, during those eight years of depression, I was not able to be there for my three older children but now I'm trying to make it up for my youngest daughter whom I'm going to do everything possible to protect her from the psychological distress that my other children have to experience. Shukran. Shukran, Ustazi Fatme. Shukran, Jazeela. I think um, Fatima Khalifa's intervention has really moved us all. 
and uh, is a clear indicator and a testimony of the amazing work that the foundation is doing. Um, let us welcome our next panelist, who will be able to speak to us more to the plight of refugees and women and their mental health as refugees. Uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Samer Haddadin, who is the head of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR office in Kuwait. He brings with him over 25 years of experience with this UN agency. He has served in many countries across the region, including Yemen, Libya, and Saudi Arabia. Dr. Haddadin, on June 20, just two days ago, the world observed World Refugee Day. Today, around 80 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes because of conflict or persecution. Those include, of course, refugees and, and IDPs, internally displaced persons. As victims of war, women suffer disproportionately in terms of mental and physical health. This issue raises a great deal of consequence that must be addressed on a community level, but also on a national level and on a regional level. Alas, in Arab countries that host a high number of refugees, there remains a gap in the availability of mental health services and a very small number of refugees will either seek or have access to mental health care support. We would love to hear your thoughts, your insights on this and the work that UNHCR is doing to address some of the mental health challenges that women refugees are facing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Her Highness Sheikh Intisar uh, and Dr. Tariq for uh, this opportunity. Uh, the work you are doing, Sheikh Intisar, we had uh, met before. And uh, allow me to share with the audience what I described. It's in Bihar from the work that you are uh, uh, doing from the, uh, the, the the new areas that you are exploring it uh, requires lots of courage lots of confidence and uh, uh, and it, uh, going outside the box not the regular box but even the bigger box because this the, these areas are really uh, new and uh, unexplored uh, not very uh, many people would have the courage to go to that direction. Uh, so God bless. Uh, inshallah. I would like also to uh, tell my sister Fatima uh, that she should not be uh, uh, embarrassed or uh, uh, having any negative feelings about being uh, a refugee. Uh, the, uh, there are uh, yani, none of us is not in a way or another uh, a refugee or coming from a refugee family. Uh, the Prophet himself was a refugee. Rasul alayhi salatu salam ya Fatima kan lajit. Sayyidina Isa al Masih alayhi salam kan lajit. Abu Lambiya Ibrahim kan lajit. Einstein kan lajit. Uh, from there, I would like to say that <coughs> I was not only moved, I was inspired. Uh, by uh, Fatima. Uh, when we say I am moved, usually comes from emotions of uh, uh, certain kind. Uh, but I say that refugees are power. Refugees are opportunities. Refugees are uh, abilities. Uh, this is why uh, we, uh, when we talk about refugees, and there are studies now, uh, coming out, uh, speaking about uh, academically uh, approved uh, approaches that refugees contribute to building peace. Uh, the other dimension here is the refugee woman. Women usually suffer more, not because they are weakest or weaker than others, but because a lot of life elements are attached to women. They are the source of life. They are the source of uh, food. They feed us, I mean, we are fed by women from the moment we are created. Uh, and after birth, they feed us uh, from breastfeeding until we grow up. Uh, the women are builders. 
uh, in my village there was uh, uh, a term say الرجل جنة والمرأة بنة البناء is more important than uh, uh, the term says that women are, are builders so when uh, when building stops women life stops when women stop building stops anyway going from there directly to the issue of refugees as you rightly mentioned uh, i don't know how uh, i can share my screen i will try my best as i speak but i i'm, I'm not very much with technology here i can maybe share screen do you see my screen now can you see my screen no no you cannot because i share i would say share now can you see the screen now yes i thank you because i see okay thank you very much uh, just quickly looking at the uh, looking at the uh, overall situation this uh, slide shows the numbers of refugees at global level or force forcibly displaced people refugees and uh, internally displaced people we have more than uh, 79.5 which is almost more than one percent of the uh, world population uh, speaking about uh, one uh, one out of 97 people is a refugee so when we say it's a little bit more one one percent it's 26 million refugees uh, 45 0.7 internal displaced people and 4.2 asylum seekers, people who will be refugees. Uh, the number increases by the hour. Most of the refugees and displaced people are in countries of low income, like Jordan, like Lebanon, like uh, Iraq now. Also, the economy of Iraq is different, but the situation in Iraq is like Yemen, uh, Africa, most of the refugees that we have globally are either coming from Muslim or within Muslim countries. So, uh, and we speak about the MENA region, we have uh, the majority of those, uh, any, the largest refugee population is Syrians. The largest host country of refugees uh, is Turkey. Uh, Pakistan is number three, speaking about the Muslim world. Uh, now, uh, in the Arab world, uh, being one of the uh, uh, critical regions in producing or hosting refugees, when we speak about uh, the protection of refugees, which is the main mandate of UNHCR, the protection, if I may say quickly, is uh, the ability of uh, individuals, regardless of sex, uh, age, uh, political background, race, religion, to uh, access uh, human rights as per international instruments. Uh, the international protection situation is being uh, led by UNHCR in the Arab world, in the MENA region, North Africa and Middle East. UNHCR is present in this region since the, the, the 50s. The, as a matter of fact, the very first uh, work of uh, UNHCR outside Europe was uh, for the Algerian uh, refugee situation in Algeria in 1956, if my memory is still fresh. We are present in the Arab world since the 50s in uh, Egypt, in Algeria, and uh, at a, a larger scale, we have uh, presence in uh, starting from late 80s, early 90s. We have one of the uh, most uh, protracted refugee situations, including the Palestinian situation and uh, the uh, uh, in Tenduf, we have a, 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 the, the, the refugee camp there uh, of the uh, Sahara situation. None of the Arab countries in the Asian part of the uh, Arab world is a member of the, uh, any refugee-related uh, instrument, except Yemen. 
All the Arab countries in North Africa are members of the 1951 Convention and the uh, uh, 1969 Convention for the African Union on Refugees, except Libya for the uh, 1951 Convention. Libya is not party to the 1951 Convention, and Morocco is not party to the 1969 Convention, but is party to the uh, 1951 Convention away from the very technical terminologies, international human rights instruments are there in the Arab world. Most of the Arab countries are party to the, uh, for example, uh, uh, Convention on Political and uh, Social and Economic uh, Rights and uh, CEDAW and uh, Convention on uh, Rights of uh, the Child, etc. But very few of them are well, a party to uh, international uh, convention on refugees for many uh, sensitivities. Some of it are political, some of it mainly related to the Palestinian issue, and some of it related to just political and demographic uh, challenges facing the countries. At the national level, almost none of the Arab countries have a durable national asylum system. But having said that, I've been working with the UNHCR for the last 27 years. Uh, I served in, re in regional positions. Uh, in one uh, region, I was covering the MENA region on refugee law uh, capacity building and refugee law, uh, promotion of refugee law and training for uh, staff and for government officials. I work with almost every government in the Arab world. There is no, uh, to be, uh, to, to, to be uh, straightforward on, on that, there is no uh, feeling against refugees as such. It is the, popular, the politicization of the problems of refugees that can come from time to time, that can create problems and challenges, to, uh, which is something that the international law and UNHCR does not uh, approve. Uh, the issue of asylum is, should not, is not and should not be politicized. It's not a political issue. It's a human rights issue. And the uh, duty to protect refugees falls on the shelter of the country that is hosting these refugees. But because most of the countries that are receiving refugees are countries with their own challenges, we usually uh, interfere as UNICEF, representing the international community to uh, uh, support the countries uh, in carrying this heavy responsibility under the international burden sharing uh, concept. And uh, with that, we uh, work with the refugees and governments on providing the protection and the durable solutions for them. Very, uh, uh, this is a very quick look at the uh, uh, theater, if I may say, on speaking about theater, uh, theatrical uh, uh, treatment. So the theater is complex. The theater is uh, in, in the MENA region uh, is full of, uh, uh, shall I say, drama? Uh, yeah, using uh, theater, theater uh, terminology. It, there is huge, but there are potentials and there are gifts amongst those here, uh, the, the, the stars of this drama that are, who are the refugees. Uh, <coughs> Uh, women, as I said, are not vulnerable. They are survivals. They are strong. Uh, and this is why uh, the, the price they pay is higher than any other price. I, I like personally to say it. Also, in many uh, humanitarian literature, women are categorized as the vulnerable groups, amongst the vulnerable, vulnerable groups, but uh, they should not be seen as such. Almost more than half of the population of refugees are refugee women and children. But uh, as I say, those are the survivals. They survived this before the displacement even starts. How many women have been arrested by the local authorities, persecuted by local authorities because her husband is a political activist or because her son is uh, a political activist? Uh, how uh, many women uh, were uh, uh, violated because of uh, being a member of this tribe or that tribe. How many women have been uh, violated by her own 
protectors usually as a child or as a woman by her tribe or family or because she uh, uh, she was considered violating the social norms. So before the displacement, women are either because of themselves or because they are women, because of their gender, are facing challenges that men usually do not face because of their gender in, uh, before the displacement. During the displacement, usually uh, the displacements that produce refugees, that's the forced displacement or the displacement that produce uh, IDPs are usually not done in a nice manner. People don't book in hotels to go and uh, book in flights. They run in the middle of the night. One, uh, one child, one of my colleagues met a child. She says that, I don't know why I escaped. I heard my father says in the middle of the night, run, and I ran. It's been five years since that war. She was a child, a little child. She jumped from her bed, running, just run. Apparently, when the story, we, we discovered the story, the whole family was killed. She was one of the survivors from the village, but all her family was killed, including her father, brothers. So during, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think uh, the question that we just received from one of the participants fits well in, 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 at this point in the discussion. Thank you for sharing that story about this young girl. The question is, are the challenges that refugees face uh, different or harder than those who are internally displaced? Uh, it depends. They, you know, when, when, when the international community was preparing the 1951 Convention on Refugees, they were talking about all refugees, including the IDPs, internally displaced people. They face the same challenges. There is no way we can say that internal displacement is easier than, but in, sometimes when you are persecuted, or threatened, your, when your rights are lost in your own country, it's harder than uh, it, uh, when you lose it outside. Sometimes the asylum uh, outside the country puts you in, in front of new challenges like language, like culture, like visa, like uh, legal status. Uh, but I was saying that when, 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 when the drafters of the convention, in the 1951 convention, was putting the, the, the draft of this convention, they were speaking about internal refugees and external refugees. But for, uh, for uh, at that time, they preferred to keep it for the external refugees, that's the refugees who cross the international borders, and keep IDPs as a, as a separate group because this was uh, the, the protection of the nationals is the responsibility of the state. So some of the drafters thought that if we include inter, uh, local refugees that has the IDPs in the convention, we are trying to find an escape for states to escape from their responsibilities. But anyway, the challenges are the same. Sometimes cases of internal displacement create more challenges on the people more than the external displacement. So we should not... Uh, uh, discriminate on based on that. To, uh, sadly, ask you to wrap up just so. Yes, we can I am. I am. I am closing. Has its restrictions. Yes. No, no, no. I am. I am wrapping up Thank immediately. You. Give Thank me you. one minute. I will. I, I will finish everything. After displacement, women usually face uh, uh, the, 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 the the responsibilities. As you can see here, for example, I brought the example of the Syrian refugees. 20%, 21% of the refugees are women. 29 are uh, women in the Iraqi. Uh, if we add the children to that, they are always above 50%. To me, this as well, UNSCR is very sensitive in recruiting women. Uh, the, the international policy the, of uh, the United Nations, the balance, the gen gender balance. I have here the figures we don't need to go through. In, at headquarters, we have more women than men in the field almost. And uh, globally, it is almost, uh, we are close to that. Uh, I, this is the last slide. UNSCR focuses on giving the woman equal uh, and meaningful participation in the community. Uh, when, we, when, when we address the problem of refugees, we have representatives of refugee women, individual registration for women, individual documentation for women, food and non-food items, distribution and management. Women are, should be there to prevent any uh, discrimination and any abuse and uh, 
prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence. There are lots of huge programs all over the world and economic empowerment of women. These five uh, uh, under uh, obligations or uh, commitments of the High Commissioner to refugee women. This Thank was you. my last, uh, I, and, and I would welcome any question or comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haddadin, for this extremely uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, it's very different when we see things in front of us in numbers, and, and we're grateful for you for that. Um, I'm very eager to listen to our final panelist of the day, Mr. Mohammed Nasiri. Mr. Nasiri is a senior UN official, has served with the UN for more than two decades. He's currently the director of Arab States and Asia Pacific region for UN Women. He is the first man to hold that post and uh, of, of regional director within UN Women and the only one thus far. Uh, Mr. Nasiri, you have been fully engaged in addressing cultural and religious forms of, uh, from a gendered perspective. Uh, you are a supporter of women's rights in the region and particularly in the engagement of women in peace processes. In my introduction, I mentioned that 2020 is the 20th anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the five-year anniversary of the SDGs. If we recall language uh, from Security Council Resolution 1889, it speaks on the importance of concrete health services, including inter alia mental health. We also recall SDG 3, good health and well-being, SDG 5, uh, gender equality, and Goal 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. I'm curious to hear more about your work UN Women is doing in the region to economically empower women and increase women's participation in decision-making, and finally, hopefully, ending violence against women. The floor is yours, Mr. Nasiri. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Karma, and I, I go by Mohammed. It's much easier and lighter. Um, I, I was in the Arab states until last year, and now I'm in the Asia Pacific. Um, يصعب علي أن آتي بعد السيدة فاطمة لأنك اختزلت ما نعمل من أجله سيدة فاطمة بألق وبهاء شديدين. Um, but maybe uh, allow me to uh, to um, start from where Samer ended about the, the victimization, but also the agency of women. I, I think it's very important to start as you rightly said, Samer, to look at uh, women as agents of change not only as victims. Indeed, they are the ones who are paying the highest price um, in every single context, uh, but they are also the ones who can push for change and make sustainable and durable peace a reality, not a dream. Um, we, we've been reading over the past few weeks uh, in various media that uh, those countries that have been best managing the COVID uh, pandemic are those who have been and are led by uh, women uh, leaders, uh, whether it was in Germany or Norway, Belgium, Iceland, New Zealand, Finland, um, South Korea, the, the head of disease control is, is a woman. Um, of course, we have to, to look at the onset that most of these countries have the benefit of well-developed, not in conflict, and have high human development. But there is something there to be said about a leadership style that is different, that is inclusive, compassionate, and calm. There are traits uh, that are different from what many traditionally associate with good leadership, uh, traits such as decisive, strong, affirmative, decision-making without consultation. In peace building karma, we see the same. Those who are most likely to wage war um, are those who are invited to the table for peace negotiations. Yet, they do not represent their community's vision for what peace might look like. It's time we shift away from this and, and that we recognize the inherent value of inclusive processes, whatever they may be, women are not more peaceful than men, but women have a different approach. The more inclusive the process, the more sustainable. We, we really have a chance now to, to rethink our values and what we cherish in decision making. Um, let us do it right. 
let us promote in all processes that our governments or the UN can influence a dialogue that is representative of the community it will serve. And, and this is where I need to underpin and underscore the invaluable work that you've been doing in the SAR Foundation in building the, the, the societal, the psychosocial makeup of that uh, infinite resource of power, uh, that of, of women. And the, the psychotherapy uh, work that you've been doing cannot be undermined. Um, as, as Lina said earlier, we are going to be reaching a million Arab women soon. And that is a power that can change the future of all of us to the better. Um, I have some, some reflections here, Karma, and I will be very happy to, to, to listen to, uh, to queries and questions. But the, one of the common messages coming from all women affected by conflict is um, that the progress is too slow. Uh, political will is not strong enough and pushback against the rights and interests of women uh, threatening the progress we've made and pushing further away those who need uh, the resolve um, and support most. Um, despite the, the many good words, agreements, discussions, and events that have taken place, change is still not free, um, and it needs to be, um, and that we need to respond to this call. Um, this year, we will, uh, as you rightly said, celebrate the 20 years uh, of the Women, Peace and Security uh, Security Council resolution. And I think we need to bring uh, to the table work and action that further closes the gap between words and action. Uh, beyond formal peace agreements, and, and again, uh, Samer has referred implicitly to that in his intervention, um, women also play a very important role in the new and emerging peace and security concerns we see, including preventing violent extremism. Uh, misogyny and support for violence against women are crucial and overlooked factors in propelling people, including women, to support violent extremism. Um, it's interesting because we've done a research last year um, as UN Women and Monash University uh, of Australia in both the Asia and the Arab states regions, and we found that there is no correlation between uh, violent extremism and degrees of religiosity, of age, of gender, level of education, employment, geographical area. There was only one common factor between violent extremism and that of misogyny. And misogyny is defined as both fear and hatred of women and or the feminine. Hostile, sexist attitudes towards women and support of violence against women are the factors more strongly associated with the support of violent extremism in all the countries that we've done the research in. So this brings us back to the agency of women and the role that women can play in this. Um, Unfortunately, we've also seen that after conflict um, in the economic recovery and the rebuilding of societies, women are primarily um, limited to uh, be cornered in the microcredit spaces, micro enterprise, uh, while the large scale reconstruction are dominated, unfortunately, by men and overwhelmingly benefiting men. Um, Within the challenges faced by, by the Arab region, and as Samer said, unfortunately, you have been destined to deal with the, the uh, forced migration and conflict for decades. Um, there lies opportunities to build on the words and intentions of women um, and the peace and security agenda. Uh, we can address this by integrating women into the discourse and into building back the societies. This can bring real change to the lives of all of us. Um, I, I do not want to leave without necessarily uh, talking about some of the um, progress that has, that has happened, because it's not all negative and it's not all 
bad. Um, and, and there has been a lot of progress that we need really to, to take stock of in, in the Arab world. Um, we've witnessed last year the historic launch of Syria's constitutional committee. Uh, women make up close to 30 percent uh, of the committee and almost 28 percent of the smaller drafting committee. Um, in Lebanon, where, where you are now, we've seen women uh, take to the streets and at the front uh, forefront of calls for a more equal society and, and the president uh, meeting, uh, committed to, to, to meeting these uh, uh, asks um, and, and look into um, having uh, even a unified personal status flow to, to support the, the emancipation of women. Five countries across the region have women, peace and security national action plans, two, another two are in the making. Um, across Yemen and Libya, we've seen efforts to increase women's representation in uh, the political dialogue uh, processes. So there are things that are happening and, and women are still not losing breath, uh, are not losing the hope, um, the, the, the perseverance of, of women is, um, is infinite. Uh, and, and this brings us back again to, to the work that you're doing uh, in, in Tussar Foundation because every single support makes a difference. And, and with, unfortunately, what we are going to see in the medium and the longer term with the economic fatigue post-COVID, we really need to remind ourselves that this and what we're doing now is a wise investment. The investment that you've been doing in Tussar Foundation, the investment that has been done by the UN at large is a wise investment and we need to continue putting uh, a lot of effort and financing in that. I stop here, Karma, and I go back to you. Thank you uh, very much for your... Uh... You are still muted, I think. No, I'm... You can't hear me? I'm, I unmuted myself. Ah. You can't hear me? I think, Mr. Uh, I think uh, Muhammad cannot hear me. Only Muhammad cannot hear me, maybe. Um, but everyone else can hear me well, right? I think we've lost... Samini, uh, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. I think we lost. I think we lost. I can hear you loud and clear now. Ah, wonderful. Women's voices must be heard. Can you hear me? Absolutely, loud and clear. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So one of the one of the questions we received from our participants is how can we how can you uh, support further initiatives and programs like the one at the Intasar Foundation and how can the work that the foundation is doing be translated to policy strategies on national levels on country levels and not remain ad hoc initiatives that are being um, put forward by civil society. So how can we close that circle of bringing the stakeholders together to make this kind of work national uh, strategy or national policy? Um, again, um, we're, we're coming uh, into this um, space uh, later than others, but as, as the resident coordinator, Dr. Sheikh said, uh, finally, the Secretary General of the United Nations have recognized and have uh, put forward last September uh, a framework on the mental health. And uh, we, we do agree, unfortunately, that it is an area um, that is most undervalued globally. Um, and especially in, in our region, what we see is a few foundations, maybe you are the only one, in addition to uh, the civil society in the region who are attending to that. And what we need to do is when we are taking the 20 year anniversary um, on the women, peace and security, we need to look into how are we uh, stop, uh, look at the 
how comprehensive the Women, Peace and Security National Actions Plans are, mm -hmm. and if we can look into integrating into the uh, National Action Plans when we update them, a right. chapter that looks after the mental health. Because this is an integral part of moving forward and of uh, contributing positively to, to processes that are going to support societies to be more peaceful. We've heard it firsthand from the Sayyid of Fatima when she was talking about how she has been a more uh, 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 positive force in her own community, whether it was her own nuclear family or largest community, when she did attend to, to the third. So this is something that we need to look at. And we need to update these uh, uh, Women, Peace and Security Action Plans accordingly. Once we do that, you automatically have a commitment from the member states to invest. Of course, there is a, a large and a, a long way between having a plan that may end up in a drawer and unpacking this plan into uh, actions and, and make a, a roadmap for implementation on the ground. And this is where we, as the UN at large, not only UN women, stand ready to unpack and, and work uh, with you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I think you've, you've identified the vehicle through which this change can happen, which, uh, and I firmly believe, just like you, that the National Action Plans for Security Council 1325 provide that vehicle for member states to jump on this kind of work and try to institutionalize it, uh, not to create more inertia and slow it down, but just to torpedo it forward uh, and make it you know, go, go further. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention. I'm uh, extremely um, uh, sad that we're, <laughs> we're at the end of our, uh, of our uh, webinar. I want to leave the floor to uh, Her Highness, Sheikh Antisar and Dr. Tad Sheikh to uh, wrap up our uh, session. Um, thank you. Uh, I leave the floor to you, Sheikh Antisar. You must, you might want to okay, unmute. I'm unmuted now. Firstly, uh, I am happy we're ending it because so much has transpired and I'm, I, I'm in awe of everything that's been shared. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing it. I would like to just thank you personally, Karma, for beautiful moderation, for taking such good care of all of us and the subjects, asking the best questions, and also supporting us to stay with our time limits <laughs> so beautifully and eloquently. So thank you for that. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know Karma, uh, and I think most people know Karma, and, and most people love Karma. I'm one of them. I met Karma by coincidence, and I'm so proud to call her a friend. And also, um, an advocate for women in peace. I love the way she does it. She uh, is advocating for and you know making sure women are moderators. Karma is about spreading peace and equality. She is an advisor on women, peace and security. The founder of Diplo Women, amazing Diplo Women initiative. Member of the Mediterranean Women Mediators Network. Currently and beautifully so. Karma is a consultant with the UN Women on Mediation and Women, Peace and Security. She was the former international, advise, uh, international affairs advisor to Lebanese Prime Minister uh, Saad al-Hariri and Karma worked at the UN's Department of Political Affairs, including the UN Special Coordinator's Office uh, in Lebanon and a force of nature, a true force of nature. I would like, Habib, to know thank you. This has been a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant webinar. Uh, thank you for all the attendees. Thank you for everyone sending all the questions and engaging and wanting to know how more they can support or what more they can do. If you have anything, please do uh, email us with any um, thing you can support us with. We're always looking for help. I would like to just before I have, I'll just give me five minutes.
I want to answer two questions. One that I, uh, I have put here from listening to everyone and one that was asked. So um, when uh, a lot of people ask why women, why is the Intosar Foundation supporting women? By the way, Intosar Foundation is not about my name. It's about because Intosar means victory. And, and we found it only appropriate that these women are victorious and we help them achieve that status. Um, basically, women are the root of all positive change. And one woman, and, and I was asked by one of our ladies, please support my children, please give drama therapy to my children. And I just looked at her, I said, I'm so sorry, no, never. And she was shocked, why not? I said, if I support your son, how many people will he influence? And she said, oh, him. I said, and when I support you, how many people will you influence? She said, many. And that's precisely why we're working with women. Women have this hunger for change. Women have this hunger for peace because it's about their families. It's about their communities and they're willing to take a challenge, they're willing to make the extra effort to bring peace. And um, so that was the for first one. And women are the nurturers. So na naturally, if we nurture the nurturers, we're going to have a more peaceful society. As you said, Mr. Nasiri, is yes, they're the most uh, afflicted, Yes, they're, uh, as uh, Dr. Samer said, they are the vulnerable, but they also have the ability to be the game changers. And, you know, women are the protectors of their family in a different way than the man. And this creative approach brings out also their sense of being, a different sense of being. One of the things we've realized is with drama therapy, women bond and have fun. And when women have fun or bond over a good thing, they want to grow it. Um, I haven't, I've never seen any um, psychological support intervention ever that there's so many smiling and giggling women. And when, 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 when someone asked about the creative arts for uh, women, we did implement an art therapy program and a drama therapy program. Art therapy did really well. Drama therapy women were giggling, were speaking out loud, were sharing emotions, were huge as life. We dropped the art therapy and continued with drama therapy because we realized this has a huge impact. Yes, dance therapy would work, music therapy would work, uh, art therapy would work, drama therapy encompasses all of them and has the oomph factor of this woman standing on a stage, be the stage a bucket or an actual stage and speaking her mind. It is deeply, deeply, deeply cathartic and it makes a change. So that is why women and uh, a great thing is, you know, there's in, in every... Uh, Thing that you, we think is horrible or in a, something good happens. And uh, when, when the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit, uh, our countries we're working with, we had to stop for sure working in our normal way. And we had to find a, a new and improved way of working because we wanted to continue to support these women. We could not in these times, these dire times, abandon them. And so I think it was day eight from when there was a lockdown, uh, our trainers and our therapists and our researchers, bless them, God bless them, يعني, I am indebted to them forever. Started calling the women, communicating with them, asking them, how are they? They were all in a very bad state. And so we had to find, we we're discussing and, and finding ways of how to continue the support for these women because they actually need it now more than they ever did. This is not a time to abandon them because we can't see them. This is a time to support them more and more because we have to. So we started working online, we're starting doing different platforms until again, we found the perfect formula that works. We do have smaller groups, but we are doing very, 
very well so far and using a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity to be able to support the women. And I'm glad to say because of that catastrophe of COVID-19, we were able to think outside the box and we're working on a, a virtual platform that will support not only the women we currently work with in the vulnerable areas, but all Arab women all over the world. Because it's a virtual, it can take on different countries. It doesn't have to be only in the countries we work with. And because it's virtual, we can have our therapists who are based currently in Lebanon because it's got the biggest pool of Lebanese uh, drama therapists. And because we have 15 who are going to be starting uh, towards the end of the year in the drama therapy co co um, uh, master's program at Uzek, they can be the trainers for Arab women across the world. We cannot be in Libya yet, but we can virtually be in Libya. Same with Kuwait, Saudi, um, any other country, even, even Syria, because currently we can't be in Syria. And so this opportunity will actually make our impact bigger and our costs minimized. And so this is then a wonderful opportunity that's come out of the um, catastrophe of the pandemic. And uh, the other thing is, I would like to share two more things. Uh, uh, Mr. Nasir, you said, and I would uh, like to say, share two more things that we've seen happen with our women uh, who go through our drama therapy is they start supporting other women. And we think it's natural, but no. Traumatized women are scared. They shut off. They do not support other women because they, they consider them as um, a threat. And what we've realized is the women start bonding, start sharing with the other in the community, not only with the group they're with. So we are, uh, Dr. Lina, we're always, uh, we're always looking at where do we see the change? And the second thing is we've seen many cases of mothers stopping child marriages, which was normal before her empowerment. She realized her daughter can do something in life. She doesn't need to... Um, marry her off to protect her. She can protect her daughter. Her daughter can protect herself. We've seen mothers who've allowed their daughters to study further. So we've seen how supporting a mother can stop many, many um, ailments. I can only say them as ailments in uh, the Arab world. Um, and the good thing, you said something about research. Yes. We do evidence-based research on everything we work on because we want to make sure that it works. If something is, doesn't work, we drop it. So far, alhamdulillah, everything we're doing works because we just have amazing people working on it from the bottom of their heart. And I would like to share Dr. Lina's upcoming uh, research. And we put it in our mandate to have at least two to three papers a year published on the use of drama therapy on women in different categories. One of them is economic empowerment, as we've seen uh, the expression. And our next one's going to be, you're gonna like that because Dr. Linus talked about it, the neuroscience-based research on the impact of drama therapy on the brain's anatomy that no one's done before. And the second one is the efficacy of e-mental care using virtual drama therapy sessions. Because we're doing it, we want to make sure they work. We know they work. We can see they work. We need to measure and quantify and qualify to be able to grow it. So I will end what I was supposed to say, what I'm saying. And thank you so much, everyone. It was a true pleasure. All the attendees, thank you so much for caring and being here and taking so much of your time. And Dr. Tara again, Dr. Samir, uh, Mr. Nasiri, Dr. Lina, Karma Yahilwa, and the beautiful, courageous Mrs. Fatma Khalifa. Sharraftina wa nawartina. Wa tatahti qalbach haqna rabbi 
يسعدك بقدر ما تتمنين مليون مرة شكرا شيخة دكتور طارق I'll leave the last word to you. At uh, any given time, I was checking the number of participants. We had a hundred participants with us yeah. most of the time. Uh, what would you like to leave them with? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you so much, Sheikh Antasar, for the convening of this uh, very important uh, topic and uh, bringing all those distinguished uh, panelists and uh, not only the balance, but also many of our attendees and distinguished attendees and professionals, ambassadors from uh, different people who are concerned with the refugees issues, women issues, and also uh, the issue of new innovative approaches to uh, try to solve uh, the issue of peace and uh, security and mental health and well-being. Uh, also, it was very important uh, and, uh, for me to see also my dear colleague uh, Muhammad Nasiri after he left uh, the, Arab, uh, the Arab state's uh, office again. Uh, on, on the other hand, I would like to uh, say uh, three key words. The first thing is that uh, the, new, the new normal that COVID has left us with dictates on us new ways of trying to solve peace and to reach peace. And uh, the new normal, I would also say that uh, we need to think more out of the box. We are here looking at different innovative solutions for solving issues of mental health, for how we uh, strengthen women leadership in peace, safety and security by new different ways. It's time that we rethink our ways of intermediation, of negotiation, and as Mohammed rightly said, to see the right people on the table for negotiation for peace. For many, for many decades, we have been seeing only men on the table. We have been seeing those, as Mohammed rightly said, that uh, who are not fully representing their societies, their communities. Women and their, uh, their role in their societies are not only at home at all, even in the refugee society. They are in the forefront. They are in the forefront of supporting their families, protecting their families, sustaining their families, uh, bringing up children up to be engineers, soldiers, doctors, and all those is supporting the community in many ways. Their mental health, their security, their safety, and most importantly, their leadership should be at the forefront. One, I would like to also to close by a, a very, very thing that is dear to me. I was in Saudi Arabia at the time of the transformation with giving more role and responsibilities to uh, women. And in that time, I will always remember it, that I will be remaining proud to have the first ever woman work continuously from the Ministry of Municipality to be from my team. And this has opened the door for many. And I think that uh, uh, seeing women and using new innovative approaches, I think drama is so excellent. Uh, drama, theater, art, uh, music, all these are things that we need seriously to try in bringing and building peace and bridging the gap between conflict communities. It's time that we think out of the box. And I think this is, this is the right time. And, and I, I don't want to thank COVID, but I would like to uh, say that uh, the, the new normal uh, dictates to us to think of different solutions. And these solutions come from innovation, like in the SAR Foundation's innovation. I have been always, honestly, a fan of, uh, of uh, in the SAR Foundation ideas. From what they do in uh, anti-bullying and supporting children uh, to lead normal life, to be, uh, uh, to be strong and professional uh, students, uh, to love each other, to, uh, to be successful. This is how. Psychology is very important. And now we see it more with this COVID. And I think we need to give it more attention. As the Secretary General has, has rightly mentioned in his strategy, we need to do more internally and externally on that. 
And thank you again, uh, Sheikh Antisar, for that. We always appreciate the partnership with you. And this is not uh, a start. It, it's only a start for our uh, future collaboration uh, in Kuwait and outside Kuwait as well. And uh, I wish also to thank my colleague and dear colleague Samer for the for the uh, actually the, the information that he has provided provided us and the work that has been doing the UNHCR in particular on refugees. Thank you, Karma, for a wonderful uh, moderation, uh, Dr. Lina, and most importantly also uh, Fatma, our inspiration in this day. I, we you really inspired us. And uh, for us, uh, you are an icon for uh, success. And I hope that you will be a model and we will use you as a model for expanding your experience. Uh, thanks to Mohammed as well. And uh, on the back to all the colleagues who have been supporting this uh, from Intisar Foundation and from the United Nations as well. Uh, thank you all and thanks to our distinguished participants and all of you, and over to you, Karma. Thanks a lot, Sheikh Ansar, again. Thank you. Uh, I want to genuinely thank the he for she's on the panel. Thank you for all the, the great men who believe in the partnership with women. Thank you, Sheikh Antisar, the Antisar Foundation, Dr. Lina, uh, the technical team uh, behind this that made it happen, all the participants, as you said, Dr. Tarek, and uh, Fatma, of course, who really, really inspired us today and put everything into perspective. Thank you very much. Uh,